Dean, it's a great privilege and pleasure to, to have you here today in the studio at the University of Sydney during the 26th Geographical Congress. And uh, I'd like to first of all say, as an undergraduate, had you, how you inspired me with your book on the restless atmosphere. I wonder if you could start off by telling us something about your background, particularly how you got interested in geography and what, what were the main sort of childhood influences that got you into this field? Well, I was born in the middle of Salisbury Plain on, a, on an old farm that uh, had been there, right, I suppose, for three or four centuries. Uh, I was a fairly lonely child. I wasn't allowed to talk to the other kids in the village because of the mysterious class structure that uh, divides England, or used to. And uh, so I talked to the rabbits and the hares and the other little rodents in the fields and climbed about the place. Uh, it was a wonderful place to be because there was an Iron Age uh, bee hill fort mm -hmm. uh, on the farm and the Roman road and I made all kinds of surface collections. I got interested, in other words, in the land. I've seen myself as a naturalist ever since. Mm -hmm. That's how I got into it. Yes. And when you went to the University of uh, London, did you start straight away in, in studying geography? You commence? I did, as a matter of fact, but it was an accident. Mm -hmm. I went uh, with a view to, to becoming a meteorological assistant. My first love as a child was uh, the atmosphere and mm -hmm. its ways, weather, uh, and I'd run a childhood weather station, that sort of thing. I, did, I had no very great illusions about my capacities and had no ambition beyond becoming a meteorological assistant. Right. And I'd need one year. So I went to King's uh, in London to, to do a year. And one of the four subjects I took was, uh, mercifully, geography. What and, year was uh, that? That was 1935. 1935. That's right. And you completed a, a first-class honours uh, in geography, did you? Yes, I did, uh, with geology as a subsidiary. In fact, I dropped the atmospheric sciences for a while. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's quite surprising. Came back to them afterwards. Right. And who were your main influences while you were at King's? Well, they were a very good bunch. Uh, mm -hmm. We were, of course, a joint school with the London School of Economics. On the King's side, there was no doubt that the dominant influence was Wooldridge, S.W. Wooldridge. Uh, he was a magnificent lecturer. Was it? Uh, oh, a wonderful yeah. teacher. And he was an august man. And uh, he taught us all kinds of things. Uh, for one thing, he was interested in religion. Uh, in later life, he, he spent a sabbatical studying Karl Barth, for example, which many people don't know, I oh, suspect. No, I didn't. Uh, he was interested in politics. He was very much the Christian socialist. He was an uh, acquaintance of William Temple, the celebrated archbishop. And all that sort of thing. He, he gave us a feeling for the, the breadth of a university which no other teacher ever quite quite rivaled. Did he influence you in any way with respect to the love of the field, field work and yes. the field discipline of oh, aspect certainly. of geography? He was quintessentially the, the, uh, the field man. On the other hand, he was also highly domestic. He felt that the eyes of the fool were on the ends of the earth. He was mm -hmm. constantly saying that. and He devoted all his energies to the English landscape and hardly anything to the rest of the world. And uh, I couldn't go along with that. Right. Uh, <laughs> I was very much a, a world student. Right. The other figure, of course, was Dudley Stamp, ah, yes. across at, uh, at the London School of Economics. You couldn't imagine a more different man, and yet they were very fond of one another, mm. and, uh, very respectful of one another's positions. Stamp, of course, was an economic geographer, but he was also an ecologist, with a very considerable understanding of, of the biological sciences. Right. He, like Wildridge, he was a geologist by training. And uh, what he taught me, or what he taught us all, was the importance of geography as a training ground for policy making and for the direct role in government that he himself exemplified in later years. I hope we'll be able to explore later on how that might yes, have influenced you or other. Well, your first project, though, was with Stamp, wasn't it? He influenced you. Yes. Uh, when the war broke out, I was already enrolled, actually, in the meteorological branch of the RAF uh, VR, but I was too young, I was below the age limit, and uh, at very short notice he asked me to do the land utilization survey reports on mm -hmm. Kakubri and Wigtown, and that was my very first substantive research, a land use analysis, and it had nothing to do with my subsequent interests, but yeah. uh, I'm delighted to have done it. Another 
aspect of your work which many people probably don't know about, uh, except for the dedicated uh, coastal fluvial geomorphology types, is your work on the, on the Thames terraces, which I, I think was my first research paper of, that I read of yours. So how did you get interested in that? Mildridge, uh, he, uh, I lived in that country. I lived at Slough in Buckinghamshire on one of the terraces that Wildridge and Linton had, uh, had written up so convincingly in a, in a series of papers of which the Institute of British Geographers monograph was mm -hmm. the best known sort of summit. And he introduced me to the terrace sequence, the lower part of the terrace sequence. I extended it upwards uh, into the, what he called the higher gravel train, which I believed then and still think is a Pliocene age and so right. I did this work uh, mostly during the war. Uh, I happened to be stationed at uh, Air Ministry headquarters for quite a while, and Wildridge was in Bristol, but uh, he came, came up from time to time. We went over the ground together. And that's really how it happened, and I'm sorry never to have had the chance to finish the work. <laughs> <laughs> did he argue with you much about it? He, I understand he was quite a, a sort of argumentative character with those who didn't uh, agree with him. How did you get In on that? later years, he became really quite difficult. He had a stroke in 1952, I think it was, and that uh, made him a, a very awkward man to, to argue with. But that wasn't the case right. when I knew him. He was a marvelous man in the field, and uh, I found him uh, tremendously supportive. In fact, the extremely detailed historical analysis in that paper of mine owes a great deal to, right. to Wooldridge. He, he provided me with the papers. He wrote some of that stuff himself and then put it in the paper without even telling me. Oh, I, I submitted it to the, yeah. to the transactions, and that's how it came to be uh, published in the form in which it's in. Right. He should have been a co-author. Well, that's interesting. W what about the war? How did, what was your role uh, with, in the war, and how did you get, did that lead you into meet, back into meteorology? Yes. Uh, I, actually, I had taken the step back beforehand. It was my first love. And in 1938, I approached David Brunt at Imperial College to find out whether I could do graduate work since I hadn't done honors physics. As a matter of fact, the physics department at King's told me that uh, I hadn't either the ability or the motivation to become a physicist. So mm -hmm. uh, um, I went over to see Brunt. He took a warmer view mm -hmm. and encouraged me. And I was actually beginning a master's degree in, uh, in meteorology when the war broke out. I see. But then he left town and I was going into the service. So uh, I, I had one marvelous year in which he was my real instructor behind the scenes. Right. Yeah, because between 38 and 39, I used to go across and see him twice a week at Imperial College. And that was a very great bonus to me. Right. And during the war, what did you do? During the war, I was in the, uh, the meteorological service. Uh, at first, I was in the, uh, the operational commands, the uh, bomber command, then, uh, then coastal command. I was then transferred into the investigations branch and worked under Charles Durst, another, I may say, major influence in my life. Right. Wonderful man. Uh, we were concerned with operational planning. I looked after various aspects of the African campaigns and later with the Far Eastern campaign. I was, in fact, uh, attached to Tiger Force, the, the heavy bomber group that was yes. going to go to Japan at yes. the end, uh, to, to attack Japan at the end of the war. Fortunately, it never got off the ground. No. I say fortunately because uh, we, that's, all that stuff is behind us now, yes. thank God. Did you have any contact with any other geographers during the war who've later reached positions of eminence? Uh, Yes, uh, I saw quite a lot of, uh, well, for example, George Kimball, who right. uh, was in the Navy, uh, who. Uh, there were geographers all through the, the three services. Many of them, I remember particularly John Le Bon, uh, who unfortunately has been dead for some years, uh, because of his insight into the, the role of land use studies in the air photo interpretation. Linton, mm, who yes, was Linton. The, the, uh, the chief intelligence officer in our field in, uh, in the photographic reconnaissance business that I got into, uh, Linton had, a, of course, a great sweep of uh, technology at his disposal, uh, which he made good use of right. after the war. And there were dozens of others. Others, yes. yes. Well, after the war, you went to Canada. What uh, stimulated your interest in, in Canada? I was simply invited to go. Uh, Kimball had been appointed from the, the Navy to the chair of 
geography at uh, McGill in Montreal, and he invited me to come and teach meteorology in his department, which uh, I did. I joined him on the 1st of January 1946, uh, the day I the, the day before I met my, my wife, <laughs> who was the secretary of the department. Right. And uh, then, uh, subsequently, uh, I remained. I, apart from a four-year stint at the University of London in the 1960s, I've been there ever since, and I've been a citizen for over 40 years. You've obviously come, come to, to love, uh, love Canada very much. Oh, I am uh, a Canadian. Uh, yes. Uh, you, you, I'm not a born Canadian, no. but I'm a convinced Canadian. Right. What uh, did you find at McGill when you went there in the geography department? What was it like then? Well, it was essentially uh, Kimball, who was a very all-pervasive presence, uh, uh, my wife, who was the departmental secretary, and myself. Uh, and that I mean, was it I mean, in, yeah. in those days. Ross Mackay came and joined us, and had a, a subsequently very brilliant career, of course, in yes. Canadian geography. And uh, then after that, one by one, they came and joined us. Theo Hills from right. New Zealand uh, came along, Brian Bird right. and Beryl from Toronto. The department grew quite rapidly, and I became its chairman in 1950 and uh, was able to continue the process of expansion. You know, those were heady days, Bruce. There was yes. lots of money, there, was lots of, uh, there were lots of students, there was uh, a wonderful mix of people. And yet, whilst you're at McGill, you decided, of course, to do your doctorate studies, but you didn't do it at McGill, did you? You did no. it at the University of Montreal. Why was that? Well, it was partly a question of being embarrassed about doing a degree in one's own university. I think that's always a bit suspect. And it was partly a desire to learn French. Mm -hmm. uh, the Université de Montréal is a, is a French institution, French language institution. I went over there with that purpose, uh, and I did indeed learn French. but. Uh, my thesis was written in English. Oh, uh, it was in English, yes. Well, yeah. uh, quite simply, the examiners were English-speaking. Right. Uh, the, there was no nucleus of skill in my field in, the, in French Canada in those days. I'm eternally indebted to Pierre Dagenet, the, the director of the mm -hmm. institute in which I did the work. But uh, I must say that most of my instruction, such as it was, came from, because it was largely a research thesis, came from uh, the the, the whole meteorological community, most of whom are of uh, uh, English descent. What was the topic of, of the thesis? The climate of the eastern Canadian Arctic mm. and its influence on accessibility. Uh, it sounds a bit odd, but it was very extensively concerned with uh, the distribution of sea ice, which was not understood at all in those days. I mean, there was a myth, for example, that Hudson's Bay didn't freeze in winter, a myth that fooled the Inuit and fooled the Hudson's Bay Company and that fooled the makers of the uh, ice atlas of the Northern Hemisphere, and which was obviously wrong. Right. How did you find out uh, what was happening? Well, first of all, it became quite obvious from pilots' reports that there was a lot more water in the bay than were being admit was being admitted. And secondly, uh, the, I noticed, as some of my early students noticed, that the air coming off the bay had obviously come off an ice surface. I mean, uh -huh. air coming off ice isn't like air coming off water. Water, yes. And uh, so we, as you know from your experience, Bruce, we, uh, we very quickly set about proving uh, this, and it was simple enough. We, first of all, uh, two or three of my students did uh, excellent master's theses on aspects of the problem. Secondly, to clinch it, the Royal Canadian Air Force flew reconnaissance flights across the bay on a monthly basis for about two years, and we photographed the sea ice at close quarters. I did some of this myself, right. and uh, there was no doubt about it. There was pressure-ridged, massive pack ice. It was not multi-year ice, but it was ice. Yes. It was not water. <laughs> <laughs> Although I argued with a, I remember arguing with a... A, with a, a priest of the Oblate Order at Fort Churchill. I had just spent the whole day flying across the bay, just above the ice surface, and he would not believe that I had seen any ice. The two aspects of your life at, uh, at McGill that uh, I'd like to talk to you a bit further about. Firstly, the development of the McGill Subarctic Research Station at uh, what was then called Knob Lake, was now referred to as Shefferville. How did, how did all that get going? In 1948 and 49, I had done some field summers in, uh, mostly in the Goose Bay region around up the Hamilton Valley, uh, very much under the influence of Ilmari Hustik, the Finnish biogeographer who, as you know, did yes. such a superb job on 
opening up the Labrador Peninsula. He had been associated with the Tanner expedition. Yes. Uh, I had tried to apply Hustick's ideas about the structure of the communities to what I could see around me in the Hamilton Valley. And from this to establish photo, photo reconnaissance uh, interpretation guides, uh, which we did, the Department of National Defense paid me what was then a very large sum of money, it sounds peanuts now, it was only about $6,000, to, uh, to, to try to convert the one in 500,000 topographic series to into vegetation and surface uh, form maps, right. which I did. Of course, Tuzo Wilson was doing the same thing with the lineations and the, from a geophysical standpoint. Yes. And so uh, we set up small labs in Ottawa, used the interpretation keys that my colleague Norm Drummond and, and Harry Lash put together to interpret the maps. And we did, in fact, complete uh, the mapping of the peninsula. And the, you can see them now in the National Atlas. Uh, yes, oh, so that was them many times. <laughs> that was the area of Western Europe, and it was a real lesson for me. That yes. stuff I did on the terrace, as you know, was that's 120 square miles. Yes. The Labrador Peninsula was 500,000 square miles. Change in scale and all And you had to change your scale and your methods and your thinking, and you were dealing with blank bits of paper. Yeah. So you, you, you had to come off your high horse and <laughs> adapt to the environment. And the, the Knob Lake experience then uh, came out of partly your familiar familiarity with the area, of course, the growing familiarity with the uh, Labrador and Garva region and, of course, the development of the iron ore mines uh, yes, coming in a very fortunate uh, set of circumstances. It was, uh, the way it happened was this. The iron ore company decided to build the town of Knob Lake right, uh, right against the, the ore bodies, right on the Quebec uh, Labrador boundary. And a small contract was offered to my friend George Jacobson, the president of the tower company who constructed many northern weather stations, to build some stuff for them. And George suggested to me that it would be a simple matter to put a, a small research lab at the end of that railway and that he would be glad to build it for the ridiculously small sum of $17,000. $17,000. Now, you've been there. You spent yes. time there. You know that we got our money's worth. Got, that's right. And uh, we opened up just before the railway did, and uh, we were able to use the railway, of course, extensively afterwards. We, I saw it as a as a jumping off ground for more intensive field studies of the interior and as a training ground for people who wanted to learn the arts of subarctic geography and the biological sciences. I think you'd be very proud of uh, that lab because a number of people who've been through it over the years have themselves risen to great eminence within the, within the discipline. Yes, I think it was an extremely good idea, but it was George Jacobson's, not mine. Oh, well, I think you've got the... But you got the Met Bureau on side, too, I think, which was... Well, that was the point. I felt there had to be a continuing program. If you don't have a continuing program in a northern station, people die of boredom in winter. Yes. Uh, the weather station compelled people to do an observation every mm. hour of the day, 365 days a year, and that is... That was the financial basis, because the the small profit we made from that financed the entire job, really. Right. So for, you went from being the head of department at McGill to being the dean uh, of arts and sciences at, at, at McGill. Uh, did that take you away from the subject? Did you, did you feel that this was a sort of a bit of a uh, time of rift uh, from the discipline, or were you no, able to I don't continue? Think so. I, I've never seen administration as being separate from teaching. I know that sounds like a heresy. It's true. I think you have to have administration in a university undertaken by people who know what it's about and who are still teaching. And I went on teaching. And uh, I may say that I think that with the exception of six months at the University of British Columbia, I have taught throughout my administrative jobs in universities uh, unbrokenly and, and always included a freshman course right. in, uh, <laughs> in what I've taught. So I have tried to live up to that, believe me. Right. Well, in 64, I understand, uh, you took another leap back over the Atlantic and uh, took a uh, position at uh, King's. Uh. Yes, Wildridge had died in 1963, I think it was, and the college did me the honor of inviting me, and I couldn't resist it. I mean, who, who could resist the temptation of going back to his old department? Right. And, uh, and, and again, you, you should know. Yes, I'm back uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just loved uh, the idea, and I enjoyed it immensely. but. It was still a joint school. Uh, the joint school had an extraordinarily rich staff. There were already people teaching my discipline. And almost as soon as I got there, 
they suggested, by they I mean the university authorities, that I should take part in the inquiry into the affairs of Birkbeck College that uh, had lost its master rather tragically. And uh, Eric Ashby was approached to chair an inquiry into its affairs. I undertook to do this. And I also undertook to remain behind as master of the college and try and bring about the Ashby uh, constitution or reconstitution of right. the college's affairs. So I had association with both colleges. Uh, I am, of course, a king's man uh, to the core. I'm a fellow of the college, sure. and, uh, but I have a very great affection for both LSE and, and Birkbeck, which... Uh, you were master of Birkbeck. I was right? master of Birkbeck. How long were you there? Oh, Only two years. Two years. Yes. And then, of course, you made another leap back across the Atlantic, but this time right across the, the, to the other side of Canada, and you became the president of the University of British Columbia. Yes, I accepted the position, and I went there for a year, but I think it would be a very questionable to say whether I ever did the job. I, I, I arrived there at a time of, of war, what can only be described as the theatre of the absurd, you know, the battle between the the student body, the university as an institution, and an extremely unfeeling and unsympathetic provincial government uh, who wanted me to take all kinds of punitive measures against the student body, which I wasn't prepared to take. So we, we won't go into, no, into that any further. <laughs> but back to Toronto, now back across Canada again, and this time to the University of Toronto. But I understand you were approached earlier uh, to go to the University of Toronto. I, well, they did offer me a chair uh, in 1952 but I wasn't able to accept it for mm. purely personal reasons. And... Uh, that was Griffith Taylor's that was Well, yes, it was. Yes. Uh, and uh, it would have been a, a wonderful opportunity for me, but I had other reasons for, to purely domestic reasons, for staying in Montreal. And I'm glad I did. I wouldn't have missed my McGill experience for years. But I must say it was a, a great delight to come to Toronto in 1969 and to find, of course, what a splendid uh, institution it, it was and remains, in, yes. in spite of uh, the somewhat lukewarm attitude of successive governments towards right. it. Right. And you went there in 69, and yes. uh, you, have, well, you still have strong connections with the place, no doubt, but oh, you, 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 re, you retired, I think, in 86, 84. 84, that's 84, right. 84, right. Uh, from the university. Yes, yes, from the university. That's right. Yes. What was your role, first of all, when you, you went to Toronto? Primarily in research and teaching, was it? Yes, was research and teaching. I, I was able to get uh, my water balance work going again. I'd been interested in the water balance uh, of the Earth's surface, and very much under the influence of Penman and Thornthwaite. And uh, I had not really done anything about it. I'd been so busy with the Labrador Peninsula. <laughs> right. I wasn't able to do much about it. But then, when I got to Toronto, I. I started a 10-year-long uh, analysis of the surface water balance of North America, which I finally published in 1980. That was, a, I think, a fairly major project, which was much more generously financed by the federal government. Uh, and, I, and apart from that, I taught, which yes. I've always done. And, enjoyed doing. Variety of courses, uh, not just sort of straight meteorology, you, you still had that concept, oh, did I, you not, of the environment and, and man and uh, Yes, I taught a first year change. course, which really, I suppose, in many ways, traces back to Griffith Taylor, mm -hmm. uh, a course uh, called then uh, Environment and Man. I had that change to the human environment for mm -hmm. fairly obvious reasons. Yes. It still goes on. I taught it right through until 1986. Uh, sharing it with uh, with others from time to time, uh, notably Ken Hewitt, who had a lot to do with its design. Uh, I taught at various times climatology in the geography department, and I taught uh, a, a long-standing physical basis of climate course in the physics department, which was uh, unusual in that it was a graduate course with uh, 15 or 20 students in it every year, which I enjoyed very much. But you also developed the Institute of Environmental Studies, or what was it? Well, I didn't really develop it. I, uh, I went back there as director in 1974, mm. uh, continuing, of course, my appointment in the geography department. Mm. But as on a part-time basis, I was its uh, director for five years. Mm. Uh, very active and still very healthy institute, which uh, is interdisciplinary to a, perhaps to a fault. Mm. 
geographers have always played a major role in its affairs. But from 1972 to 74, you moved out of uh, the university and uh, assisted the government in... Well, one of Pierre Trudeau's really bright ideas was uh, a thing called Interchange Canada, which was a system whereby senior executives from the business world could spend a couple of years in the federal government and vice versa. The right. federal civil servants could go into senior management in the corporate world. And they had some difficulty in getting people from the corporate world, and they turned to me, and I was one of the first six appointees under this. I went in as Director General of Research Coordination, which is an absurd title, right. uh, in the Federal Department of the Environment, which was then new, and we were sort of mapping out the proper role for a federal government in a federal state in the environmental arena. After all, the, the governing uh, statutes uh, the, and uh, the constitution of the country assign responsibility for resources to the provinces, and it was therefore not easy to see what the federal government should do. And my job for two years was to look at the research programs and to think out the logic of how they might be a, useful, and B, constitutional. Do you feel your time there was uh, worthwhile and oh, successfully yes. spent? Oh, I mean, it gave me an insight into how politics was conducted in Canada and uh, it's the frustrations of, uh, and yet at the same time, the boundless opportunities of life in a federal country. Yes. Uh, yes, I enjoyed it immensely, but I was awfully glad to get back to the university. I, mean, I really am a, an universitaire. Right. And you became the provost, didn't you, of Trinity? college at the yes. university? In 1979, I have always felt that large universities need some kind of molecular structure and uh, Toronto has from the first been a collegiate university. Uh, Trinity was one of the old colleges that had been uh, founded actually by the Anglican Church, uh, by Bishop Strawn who also founded the university. And it was a federal member of the university, but it had its own governing body and statutes. And uh, so I was provost and vice chancellor. Uh, and uh, that still left me free to be a member of the university and to continue my teaching. And how long has, did that position That continue? went on uh, from 1979 to 1986, when I finally retired from that as well. And you are now Professor Emeritus of the University of Toronto. That's right. But that hasn't completed your relationships with universities because I understand as of the first of this year, you've become the, uh, what is it, the, the Chancellor, Chancellor of, of, the, of Trent. That's right, of huh? Trent, which as you know is, is in Peterborough, Ontario. It's a small collegiate university again. And uh, my job is the purely titular one of uh, conferring degrees and presiding over ceremonial so you're going to do a bit of teaching, oh, yeah. or you're going to get more in involved than that. So of course, yeah. I, I fully intend to take uh, a, a, an active role in the teaching program, mm. and I've already volunteered my services to Colin Taylor, the associate dean, and mm. uh, others who are willing to listen. <laughs> Let's uh, have a look at more at some of your research and uh, the nature of it. I've one of the things that's fascinated me has been the the marriage, if you like, of the, the micro scale and the, the macro synoptic scale that you've been able to achieve uh, with your work. Uh, and the micro scale, the sort of work that's epitomized by water balance studies and evapotranspiration, uh, relationship to vegetation types. And then the synoptic work, of course, dealing with uh, the, what's come out of presumably your wartime experience. How, how do you feel about this today? In the, looking back on things, uh, how, how have you been able to, to bring together these two vastly different scales which many uh, climatologists, meteorologists would like to keep quite separate? Oh, I think it was a, an accident, but it, it certainly with the accidents that uh, accorded with my personal preferences. I began in life, uh, I'm fond of saying, as a meteorologist at the age of four when mm. uh, uh, I discovered that one of my aunts was afraid of thunderstorms, and I got fascinated with the uh, with thunderstorms and convective precipitation. And I started running a weather station as a child. Uh, I ran one. In fact, it, the results were published uh, in the British Meteorological Office publications. Uh, I was in dread that they would discover I was a child. Oh, it <laughs> so. Uh, but I, the thing that really fascinated me was the weatherman the changing map of the weather and the world distribution of climate. And all through school and all through uh, 
undergraduate university where I had some very good and sympathetic teachers in this, my real interest was in the macro scale, in the general circulation of the atmosphere, its, its uh, energetics, and what made it tick. And when I went to Brunt, of course, that, that process continued. It was after the war when I really had to think out the logic of the discipline of geography that I came back to the micro scale because I think it certainly is the surface energy balance and the surface moisture balance that, and nowadays the surface exchange processes of all kinds, that seem to me to relate to the rest of the discipline most closely. And for a good many years I worked on the water balance under that assumption. But then in 1954, uh, Harold Sverdrup, uh, who was influential in the U.S. Air Force in those days, decided to offload the uh, Arctic Meteorology Research Group from UCLA, where Jack Bjarknes no longer wanted it, and he offered it to me. And uh, so it came to McGill and is uh, really still there. And in right. fact, it was my second major invention at McGill, the first being, being the, the Shefferville Lab. Shefferville, yes. I but was. All, actually, it was all simultaneous right. because the years are the same, you see? Yes. Um, this involved uh, getting back into the large scale, and for I decided for some years to make the stratosphere my and its dynamics my major field of uh, in inquiry. And the papers in those years are largely in the meteorological literature, and they have to do with the polar night westerlies and their unstable disturbances, the summer circulation, uh, the uh, the wave behavior of the system, and, and so on. It was in those days all new and fascinating, when we were seeing things for the first time. Isn't it? Because that northern part of Canada really was un unexplored territory, not oh, only yes, on the ground, absolutely. but also in the atmosphere. I mean, we discovered that the, uh, it wasn't we that made the discovery, but we were among the first to look in detail at the explosive, uh, 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 explosively unstable winter stratosphere, right. which uh, uh, Scherhag in uh, Berlin, I suppose, was the real founder of, but uh, we were close on his tail, and we were looking at them in detail. And this was fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have stayed with it if, uh, well, if I hadn't got involved in administration again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Pen Penman, Thornthwaite, and Budico, three names that yes. I know have had some influence yes. on you. How, how you? Well, I thought that, that uh, the trouble with Warren Thornthwaite, who was one of my great friends and I thought was a genius, was that he, he while he could propound the problem of the unity of the Earth's surface. He wasn't very good at putting the physics in. Penman was much more interested in the physics than he was in the unity of the Earth's surface. Budiko and the Russian school generally seemed to me to have put it together. Uh, yes. Davitaya uh, afterwards told me uh, that, uh, that this was not exactly an original idea because he had said the same thing himself uh, years before, but it seemed to me that uh, that the the Soviet uh, work on the, the energy balance typified by Budiko. I mean, he was the, the, the person who made it f first visible, but he wasn't by any means its pioneer mm. on the ground. Uh, he himself gave great credit to his predecessors. It's a long-standing tradition right. in the Soviet Union. Yes. And I thought much closer to the core of geography than the kind of thing I was actually doing. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your role in public uh, issues and policy making because I know in the last 15 years or so you've been very close to this in Canada through a number of different uh, organizations and enterprises and you've certainly had a great influence on policy making with respect to the environment in Canada. How, how, I mean, do you see this as a natural expression of a geographer's interests and a geographer's way of doing things? I think a geographer is well equipped to do this if he or she so chooses. This is a, obviously a personal choice. Uh, I was, I suppose, influenced unconsciously by Dudley Stamp. Stamp had uh, had me appointed to the Advisory Committee on Natural Resources in England in 1964, I should think, or five. And uh, then I became a member of the Natural Environment Research Council and the Nature Conservancy. And I saw the, the absolutely fascinating way in which the various disciplines contributed to, uh, I suppose you could call it the formulation of public okay. policy, although honestly I don't really think that policy is formulated. It happens almost yes. uh, accidentally. It's a hit and miss business. Nevertheless, it's policy related. 
And I, I was fascinated in this, as I said, and when I came back to Canada, I was uh, very willing to get involved with it again. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, in my environment job. And then, uh, from 1977 onwards, the various public inquiries have come my way, as they did to Stamp. He was, of course, vice mm -hmm. chairman of the Scott Committee. And, uh, and your interest here, of course, was put together partly through your involvement with the Royal Society in, in Canada, is that right? Yes. Uh, at first, in 1977, for example, the government asked me to do uh, an analysis of the nuclear waste issue, uh, which I did. I did that alone, or rather with two colleagues, uh, but without institutional sponsorship. We felt pretty naked dealing with an issue of this kind without any validating body. So when the government came back at me in 1979 or 80 and asked me if I would become involved in the acid deposition issue, uh, I said yes, as long as there's an institutional sponsor. And fortunately, the Royal Society of Canada said they would be willing to act as a sponsor, as did the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. And we did all that acid rain work for three years uh, under the single sponsorship of the Royal Society or the National Academy of Sciences. So we always had this umbrella above us. And with each subsequent investigation I've done, I've sought the same cover. And you are continuing to be involved in these sorts of inquiries? Have you got yes. something going now? Well, I've just finished a, a very major inquiry into nuclear safety. The uh, Ontario has 20 power reactors uh, in, in action or nearing completion. 16,000 megawatts of uh, power uh, will be available when it's finally through. Uh, this, uh, in the wake of... Uh, what happened at Chernobyl was yes. a pretty alarming thing for a, a government which was actually committed in its election manifestos to phasing out nuclear power. It was a very awkward situation for them, and they they decided to go ahead with it. But they asked me if I would uh, look at the safety issue, and uh, I got the Royal Society in as, in an advisory capacity because I couldn't tackle it alone. No. And that went for a year and a half. I just finished it. It was a big project cost a million and a half. <laughs> well, the IGBP is coming up and people are becoming more and more conscious of global yes. environmental change yes. and its impact and how we are influencing, of course, the, the nature of the environment. Do you see a role for geographers in these sorts of big multidisciplinary type programs? For, oh, I think I see a role for geographers in, in all these questions. I think geography is a is a you, you perhaps have heard me say in the past that uh, I don't really think of it as a discipline. I think of it as a, as a, as a, as a confederacy of like interests, connected perhaps by special concerns and so on. But basically, we are one of those few platforms left in the academic world where things can be brought together. And public policy is bringing things together. We are naturals for this. Uh, if you want to get involved, you don't have to. It's a, it's a very tough business, is working in the policy arena. But science is so dominated by reductionists and people oh, yes. who think in their own little boxes and try to project that uh, across in such a way that they try to dominate others. Uh, what can we do about this? And does it... well, Arthur Peacock says that uh, reductionism is nothing buttery. <laughs> And I agree with him. I think that uh, reductionism is a necessary, fundamental step in, in understanding nature. But I, ne I think it's never enough. There must be other insights. Uh, and you must somehow be able to hold things together. I suppose I've been trying to do that in a cack-handed sort of way. And uh, geography is one of those disciplines which, word I said I wouldn't use, and I have just used it. I think it's a... Uh, a discipline that compels you to take account of all the evidence. Do you like, think other, other scientists take us seriously in that respect? No, no. For the most part, they don't. But then that doesn't worry me at all. I think we should take the initiative. Uh, I'm very sorry that the environmental movement uh, that led to the establishment of so many institutes of uh, environmental studies was not spearheaded by the geographers. In most places, it was not. Why wasn't it? Oh, well, you know, we were, we were intimidated into thinking that there was something wrong with the environmental idea. I mean, obviously it didn't intimidate such men as Gilbert White, uh, uh, but it did intimidate many people. Dick Hartshorn's uh, view that, uh, well, perhaps I, I shouldn't misquote him, but 
the environment didn't get a very sympathetic handling in Dick's book and books. And, uh, you know, he had a tremendous influence on the way geographers thought worldwide. And we hadn't recovered from that environment, that sort of methodological analysis, when along came this very non-methodological idea that the public had to do something about the environment. Yes, geographers, I think, through the 50s and 60s were terribly prone to be navel-gazing and what, well, wondering we were, what the heck they were on about. We were concerned with the validity of our own study, and the public couldn't have cared less about the validity of our study, but it does care about the environment. And uh, I wish we had been on, on deck and on duty when, uh, when the movement started. So you see a, a good future for, for geography? You see us in, in not only as a... Well, I, I use the term discipline now, not only as a discipline within a university context, but, but also in being able to project ourselves into the community. I see the need for people like us. And I see the need for this kind of transdiscipline in the university. I see a very high degree of relevance to the public interest and to public causes. I don't see yet uh, a unanimous agreement among geographers that that is the case. I think that we are still a bit divided among ourselves by ideas that came in from outside. Any good uh, discipline grows in this fashion by yes. absorbing ideas from outside. Uh, but it's not easy to reconcile the, the extremely wide physical and biological as well as social demands of being an environmental student with, uh, for example, the behaviorist teaching of the depart with the departments over the years, in, in recent years, which I didn't share, but I certainly support. It, it's not a criticism, but it just wasn't, it wasn't in phase with what was happening outside. And I think also our preoccupation with numerical and quantitative techniques absorbed a great deal of energy. It was a necessary thing. It was not necessary to a climatologist who lives surrounded sure, by numbers yeah, and computers, but it, it was an innovation for the people who might otherwise have been leading us into the policy. Arena. Perhaps we've uh, matured or developed now a platform from which we can become more integrated. And, uh, well, I mean, look at this, look at this uh, agenda that you've drawn up for us at this Congress. It is full of this kind of stuff. And thank God it is. Uh, I think it's a little difficult to sustain uh, in the university setting. Uh, it's not easy, you know. The public is interested in the environment, but not in books about the environment. It's interested in, and the student too, I think, is, is sees this as an action sphere rather than a, a sphere of fundamental understanding. It's not easy to be an activist and be a scholar at the same time. So, And that's, you've found that to be the case with your own career, have you? Very much so. I have had consciously to say to myself, don't be an activist, don't espouse causes. I do, privately, but I don't. In my you don't call yourself an environmentalist. No, I don't, and I don't call myself any kind of ist, right. uh, except perhaps a pragmatist mm. uh, I am, and a scientist. I do approach these, these issues with the view that if you're going to be any use at all, you've got to approach it as objectively as you can, and uh, you've not, you've, you cannot decide what the solution is before you start the inquiry. Ken, it's been a delight to talk to you about aspects of your career and life and thoughts and views and views of the future at work as well. And given the, the link that there's been over the years between Sydney University and Toronto, yes. uh, I think this is a most suitable place We've to have uh, had this interview. Two ends of the Griffith-Taylor axis. That's very, very true. Yes. Thank you very much, Ken. Pleasure.